Hello everyone, it's Mr. Johnson here with another episode of the Artist Gallery. So if you are one of my students, make sure that you have your artist images, sketchbook, scissors and glue stick, and a writing utensil so we can be cutting and pasting our pictures into that sketchbook and taking the notes that appear in the white boxes on the screen alongside each of these images. Today, the artist we will be talking about is the incredible comic book illustrator Jack Kirby. So make sure you have the Jack Kirby images out and we can start adding his pictures into our artist collection uh, for today's discussion. So let me go over some of this information for you. And while you are cutting and pasting his pictures, I will give you some background information. Jack Kirby was born Jacob Kurtzberg in New York City. Um, he, well, when he started creating comics, he went by a variety of of pseudonyms, but he eventually settled on Jack Kirby. <laughs> um, so uh, he grew up in New York, and when he was 14, he attended the Pratt Institute for Art for only one week. He left after a week. He said, this isn't for me. He is mostly self-taught as an artist and an illustrator. So his birthday is August 28th, 1917, and he died of heart failure February 6th, 1994. <laughs> Jack Kirby is one of comic books' most prolific and influential creators. He would co-create uh, almost all of the characters in the Marvel pantheon that we are familiar with, as well as many uh, big characters for DC Comics and other uh, comic book publishers as well. He began working on comics in the 1930s. And in 1940, he and writer Joe Simon create Captain America for what was then called Timely Comics. It would eventually become Marvel. Uh, Captain America was a huge hit and, uh, you know, created early in the 1940s before Marvel even existed. Jack Kirby was drafted uh, and served in the European theater in World War II. He landed on Omaha Beach in Normandy on August 23rd, 1944, two and a half months after D-Day. Uh, in the 1960s, he is best known for the prolific creations that he co-created with author Stan Lee. Now, there's a lot of uh, unfortunately bad blood between Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, and Marvel Comics, as um, Jack Kirby was unhappy with the way that Marvel had treated uh, had create treated its creators, and uh, Jack Kirby had sued Marvel multiple times over copyright and ownership of the characters that he helped create. And there was a lot of discrepancy between Stan Lee's descriptions of how these characters were created and Jack Kirby's. So now they are uh, credited as co-creating each of these characters where Stan Lee wrote the description of the character and Jack Kirby came up with the visuals. But at Marvel in the 1960s, oftentimes um, the artist would create the plot for the story. So Jack Kirby and Stan Lee would talk briefly about what should happen in this issue of a particular comic book. And then the artist would then draw the whole thing and give it to the writer. And then Stan Lee would go in and add all of the dialogue and captions. So it was a very interesting collaboration, but because of this, it led to a lot of discrepancies as to who actually came up with a lot of these ideas. But regardless of that, Jack Kirby is known as the king of Marvel Comics and uh, really paved the way for all of the you know huge Marvel and, and DC uh, characters and creations that came for years after this. So let's talk about just a few of the iconic characters that Jack Kirby uh, helped create, including Captain America, Thor, and the Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, the Black Panther, the Fantastic Four, and the Inhumans, uh, all of the original X-Men, Ant-Man uh, and the Wasp, Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, 
Hawkeye and Black Widow. So if you're enjoying right all of these uh, massively popular characters that were created I know, in the 1960s, Captain America, a few decades earlier, but all these other characters created in the 60s um, were all designed and illustrated by Jack Kirby. I'm going to show you this uh, video where uh, they dissect uh, one issue of a Thor story, Thor's first appearance by Jack Kirby. You can really get to see how he um, creates the dynamism for all of these exciting narrative stories that uh, Jack Kirby goes on to create. And he does this not only in obviously this Thor comic, but in all of the books that he illustrates. It's why he is known as the king. And of course, hopefully this plays... I'm doing construction right outside my house right now. So, of course, we get all of that background noise. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, video. Let's see if it goes. Um, Jack Kirby is known as the king of movement and dynamism in his comic book panels. Early comic stories at the time would be very stiff and static, but Jack Kirby created a sense of motion and excitement in the comic panels that had not been done before. So by today's standards, the art isn't nearly as realistic or photorealistic as a lot of what you see in current comic books. But this idea of movement um, is what he worked for. But today, but today I, want to I want to focus less, less on, on what he created and instead talk about how, how he created. How did Jack... Uh-oh. No. Do not give me the spinny circle. We just want to talk about cool comic book creations by the amazing Jack Kirby. Kirby create his dynamic and energetic art style. Jack Kirby's artistic style is easily recognizable. Many elements make his work stand out from the Kirby crackle, aka the Kirby dots of fractal energy, to the way that he would forego human anatomy for the sake of a dramatic pose. At the heart of it all was Kirby's ability to infuse nearly every panel with dynamic action that made superheroes actually feel super. Quote, what Kirby brought to the comic book page was an opera of line and mass. The stories didn't matter. So much drama did his anger bring to the figures bursting out of the panels, the bodies hurtling through space as fists and feet drove into them, the faces contorted in passion, the camera angles swinging wildly, and the panels stretched and bent by the needs of the action." End quote. Kirby drew a world in motion. I think we take that for granted nowadays, but there was a time when artists and inventors were fascinated with capturing movement in a static image. Some tried to showcase movement through a series of pictures, but others wanted to showcase action in a single frame. Eventually, this idea fell into the lap of comics creators. Sure, artists could demonstrate motion by having successive frames inch a particular movement forward in time like frames of a movie, but wouldn't it be much more efficient to show entire action? of dynamic motion in the span of a single image? Thus, motion lines were born. While sloppy at first, brilliant artists like Jack Kirby transformed and stylized this concept, imbuing what were once simple lines with force and speed that seemed as though it could crack the earth in two. To dissect just one comic in Jack Kirby's endless catalog, let's take a look at Journey into Mystery number 83, featuring the very first appearance of Thor in a story titled Thor the Mighty and the Stone Men from Saturn. When one is introducing a new character, there is no more important issue to nail than their first First one. And from the opening splash page, Jack Kirby not only instantly provides some energetic imagery, but he also gives the audience a wealth of information about the hero and his alter ego. There's no doubt that Thor takes center stage. He's in a dramatic pose with his trusty hammer Mjolnir radiating with energy and angled towards the readers. Just under that, in two very tiny panels, is Donald Blake drawn small and dull by comparison. In fact, every time we see Donald Blake in this story, he's never portrayed interestingly. Even when he's the only character in the panel, he's small and typically in the background. It's only once he finds the mystical cane that transforms him into Thor that Donald starts getting more close-ups and a little bit more action. Then, with a burst of energy containing enough power to last three entire panels, Donald Blake becomes the mighty Thor. Thor starts to display much more dynamic movement, but his full power hasn't yet been realized. Thor's body language merely echoes Donald Blake's from pages earlier. But as he starts to discover his power, we get one incredible page. Thor starts to test his hammer's abilities, first by throwing it into the air and having it return. Simple, non-destructive action. 
but the next few panels show him raising the bar by hurling Mjolnir at a tree and splitting it right down the middle with a large, energetic crash. Kirby is building up the momentum. In the final three panels of this page, Thor learns of his ability to create and command storms, ending in this powerful image. Thor went from here to here in the span of one page as Kirby kept building upon the comic's energy. As the final battle of the comic approaches, Thor swings his hammer around and flies towards the action so rapidly that Kirby, unable to capture the Asgardian warrior's speed, can only render him as a blur soaring through the air. He leaps into the literal middle of the fight, swinging his weapon with enough force to tear apart his enemies. Kirby doesn't let up the action for a moment, utilizing camera angles that make the reader feel in the midst of the battle, fighting alongside Thor. Jack Kirby's use of dramatic camera angles is something you might have noticed throughout this story. In contrast, you can look at a story like Action Comics Number 1 by Siegel and Schuster and see this classic Superman scene. Yeah, there's some good movement here, but for the most part it feels like we're simply looking at the action from afar through a static, boring camera angle. Kirby's method was decidedly personal. He aimed to make the reader feel like they were involved in the action, not just passively observing it. His angles featured characters and objects almost popping off of the page towards the reader. And when Kirby does pull the audience out of the action, it's to showcase a grand perspective. Take this panel near the end of the comic where Thor stands victorious as the entire armada of alien ships leaves Earth. Even though this shot is looking straight at Thor from a distance, like those Superman panels from earlier, this image still feels more exciting and triumphant. Thor's flowing cape and hair coupled with the fleeing vehicles help fill the scene with an abundance of movement. Thor defeats the monsters and transforms back into Donald Blake, once again depicted as small and weak, contrasted against Marvel's colorful, hammer-wielding hero. This is simply one of Jack Kirby's stories, and it's probably not even his best example to use, but hopefully you can appreciate how much energy and excitement the king put into every line. Jack Kirby's artwork may have been sketched in lead, but his legacy and influence on the comic's art form are drawn in... Oh, I love this. Um, oh, it, it was drawn in history. I don't know why it, it uh, stopped there right before the last word, but I think it's amazing. Um, Jack Kirby's uh, legacy, I mean, continues forever because um, the, of not only the characters that he created, which you know are are numerous, they're they're everywhere, right, in Marvel and in in, in DC as well. Uh, but the style, the action, the drama, the weight that he gave to his comic book illustrations changed the way that everyone drew at at uh, at the time. So uh, this is the first image you have for Jack Kirby. It's an interior page from um, a comic book called Tales of Suspense from 1967. And this <laughs> shows that Jack Kirby is a master of storytelling and action. Here, the writer has chosen not even to include dialogue in the scene. There's a small caption at the top and the very bottom of the action. This is Captain America uh, in heated combat with a character named Batrick the Leaper, who is uh, the guy uh, on the boat in Captain America and uh, the Winter Soldier. He was also uh, the lead character that Falcon battles in the uh, helicopter scene in the beginning of the first episode of Falcon and Winter Soldier. So even that character right, has been in two Marvel uh, uh, projects you know, on the screen since his creation. So just take a look at how, although know, each of these panels is exactly the same size, Kirby changes the camera angles like he's a movie director. Here you see um, the shot from behind Patrick running and Captain America, you know, small, far away. And Cap, you know, swings and is able to, to hit him. And Patrick goes flying on those legs and arms fly in different directions, right? Here he swings his foot and Captain America just back bends right over him. You see the dynamic action created by all these motion lines in the backgrounds and the poses as Captain America defeats our foe. But what exciting drama. Now, uh, in Marvel Comics, uh, when in the 1960s, when Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were uh, creating uh, you know, Thor and Iron Man and the X-Men and the Avengers and the Fantastic Four and Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, uh, Stan Lee would have 
Other artists at Marvel study Jack Kirby's work. He would often have Jack Kirby sketch layouts and have other artists draw right on top of Jack Kirby's work in order to learn how to draw like the master. Um, I think that was really, really cool. The second image that you have is the cover to Avengers number 12, the 12th issue ever of the series in 1965, again by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. And this shows dynamism and Jack Kirby's incredible use of composition. So here you have the original Avengers from the comics. There's Thor right in the center, right bashing Mjolnir into the ground, um, surrounded by Iron Man, Giant Man and the Wasp and Captain America as they would appear, you know, in the Avengers in the 1960s. The Hulk had already left at this point. And then, so these characters are front and center. They fill the whole space. They, they go off the edges of the page. And then in the background, you see our villains, the Mole Man, uh, back here, right? So he makes an appearance, but it creates the sense of, de of depth by shifting the scale of the figures from the large figures in the front to these very small characters far in the background. And just look how every character's pose is so dynamic and so different, reaching forward, pointing their hands right, right at the screen. You get all of this excitement and energy through Jack Kirby's work. Something you do not have um, is the cover to Fantastic Four number 72 created in 1968 where uh, the use of color creates this amazing focal point. So here color makes uh, the watcher and the background of space all shades of red and purple while the main figure, the Silver Surfer, is white and blue and yellow. The Silver Surfer was one of Jack Kirby's favorite comic book characters that he created for the Fantastic Four uh, that he had a lot of contention uh, with Stan Lee over how to handle the character. And they never really saw eye to eye on who the Silver Surfer should be. Um, and then here's something that um, you do not have, but I just wanted to show you an example here. On the left is Jack Kirby's original artwork um, that's been you know illustrated and then inked over uh, with brushes and pens to create these black, bold lines. On the right is uh, how it looked actually in the comic book with color added and then printed. The print quality in the 1960s was not that good. So you can see even that the, the black lines are a little faded and the detail gets a little bit lost because the, the printing that Marvel used and all the comic book companies used early on in the 60s was not very high quality. But I do think it's really cool to see his original art compared to what was, uh, you know, finally uh, printed. Here, uh, talking about original art, um, this is the cover to Fantastic Four number 86. And this is the original drawing by Jack Kirby, what he actually, you know, worked on with the, you know, this is the board that he drew right on, created in 1969. This is done in pencil first. He would draw out the entire scene in pencil, and then it would be gone over, with ink, usually a brush, you would dip a brush into ink and paint the lines on, which is, is very difficult to do. Um, you could see some whiteout in a few areas where they decided to change something a little bit up here in Dr. Doom um, that has been uh, altered. But I think this cover is incredible. It shows a great use of scale shift where Dr. Doom is shown huge towering over our Fantastic Four characters down here, uh, along with Crystal of the Inhumans. Uh, she's the fifth one. But you get that huge scale. Dr. Doom is gigantic. And also look at the way Jack Kirby uses line weight. His lines are never the same thickness. Their lines around Dr. Doom are bold, right? Whereas the lines in the rocks down here are much thinner because they're not nearly as important. So that use of line weight and scale there is incredible. So again, Jack Kirby not only created these amazing characters from Marvel comics, including, uh, you know, the Hulk and the Avengers. Um, the Submariner was created by Bill Everett. Well, but, you know, reused here in the Avengers. So this is a cover you don't have. I just think it's so dynamic and so exciting. Um, but Jack Kirby, uh, after being fed up with working uh, at Marvel, he eventually left and worked at DC, its rival, where he drew uh, lots and lots of DC stories and created the new gods. So characters like, I don't know if you've heard of them, but Darkseid and Steppenwolf were characters created by Jack Kirby during his time working at DC. So I thought that was pretty cool. All right, so here's what I'd like to know for my students. You have a journal entry. How do you think Jack Kirby's work has influenced popular culture? So again, my students, when you finish your artist page, you should have all the pictures pasted down. Um, 
and included the names of all of them from those white boxes on the screen, take a photo of it, add it to the artist gallery assignment, and then in the text box, tell me, how do you think Jack Kirby's work has influenced popular culture? Hope you enjoyed learning about Jack Kirby. There's so much about him to look into. Uh, if you're interested in more of what he created for Marvel and DC, DC Comics, give him a quick Google and you will find all this amazing information. We'll see you next time.